So here's where we left off. Bailey's. What in the heck is that in the back of him? Yeah. Why did that? Why is that up there? You said it. Yes. Also, he was able to measure the tops, how high the, the pyramids, without having to take a and climb. Well, I'm not sure if you can even climb up the pyramids. How do you think he did? So, uh, Geometry. Geometry. Weight point of day in which his all right, everybody knows their height. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty standard. But there is a point in the day when the sun will be just right where your shadow cast out will be the same length as your light. Empiricist, you could be a moderate. 
let's just go to the extreme. Let's say I'm an extreme empiricist. Then I would say that all of reality is empirical, physical. If we ask, what does that mean? Exactly what you said, that physical or materials, whatever, is capable of being detected by your five senses. So if you are a radical, hardcore empiricist, would you believe in uh, ectoplasm, ghosts, no. material souls, gods, God? No. So they would say, I'm not going to believe in anything I can't see, touch, or taste. That's what's most real. And therefore, so that's a question about reality and ontology. What's the word ontology? What does that mean? Regarding or pertaining to what? Yes, good job. So, if all of reality is physical there's no, and natural, there's no supernatural or non-physical entities or properties, then all knowledge, Greek word episteme, epistemology, pertaining or involving the study of knowledge. And all knowledge, if you're a hardcore empiricist, is restricted to your five senses. Now a rationalist will tend to emphasize reality, or the archaea of reality, not in terms of physical, sensible entities, but rather they'll invoke rational principles. Rational principles that cannot be detected. Ideas and rational thoughts, like the number two, can you drink the number two? Can you pour it into a glass? Can you smell it? No, it's an abstract material entity. Now you can illustrate it showing, oh, look here, two pens. That's not the same thing as number two. That's something illustrated. And also, therefore, their understanding of knowledge would not be restricted to your senses. The curious is going to say, you can only know what your senses deliver to you. A rationalist is going to say, no. Your knowledge is grounded out and justified in terms of rational principles. Now, have you ever seen or heard about this in politics? Pendulum? Swinging from one side to the other? So what happens in American politics? Democrats get in for a while, and does it stay that way forever? What happens? Then there's a reaction to, it goes, then all of a sudden it's Republicans for a while, and then what? It's just back and forth, forever, straight into hell. <laughs>
So that means that occultism and spiritualism, seances, tarot cards, and turning your coffee upside down to read your coffee grounds, is in, in Aristotle's view an overreaction to some other type of extreme. So it's not as if the extreme was, well, people were just attending church so much and they just got fed up with it. And so they went into the occult. Supernaturalism, spiritualism, there was something else. So maybe perhaps the middle ground would be a moderate religious belief, people going to church or something like that. But that isn't the extreme that they're reacting to, the pendulum. So if over here you have the occult, spiritualism, and seances, what do you think the extreme over here is? that it's reacting to. Yes, radical materialism and empiricism. It's exactly the scientific revolution comes in. That's why I mentioned steampunk. Everything's in terms of mechanisms and machines and stuff like that. It has taken the life out of nature. Everything is a machine. Animals have no life. You can just break them into mechanics. Well, that might not sit well for people, but instead of bending the stick straight, what do people tend to do? This happens in the history of thought and philosophy as well. Between, like I said, you could be a moderate empiricist, a moderate rationalist, perhaps some combination, but when you get these extremes, you have this kind of infighting of radical empiricism, then you get a reaction, a pushback. You know what? We do that with our parents. Right? Our parents have certain ideas about the way you should be, what you should be doing, and a philosophy of life, and what happens when we become about 17, 18 years old. Get out Get away from me, brother. Keep your ideological values to yourself. And you push back. In part, you're doing that because you're all a bunch of rebels, rebellious, retrogrades. No, I'm kidding. You're doing that because you want to establish your own identity. You don't want to be an appendage of your parents. Well, the mother said, the mother said, never, never put salt in your eyes. <laughs> No, you want to be able to think for yourself, and so part of that is biologically ingrained within us to push back. I'm going to find my own identity. I'll listen to my own music. I'll read my own books. Right? Or did you not go through that phase? I did. You? A little bit? I imagine various degrees. Yeah. Uh, how does the human know that it's that right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is something very interesting. The Hegelian dialectic, that Hegel is somebody we're going to get to here, um, later in the history of philosophy. He's a, a German philosopher um, who is the father, really, of, he begins the father of phenomenology. Uh, but Marxism comes out of Hegel. Marx is a Hegelian, Karl Marx. So the Hegelian dialectic, does anybody know what a dialectic is? We mentioned one, Republican Democrat. Two opposing forces that are in tension with each other. The Hegel's dialectic is simply the natural outpouring of philosophy and the fulfillment of the dialectic goes all the way back through philosophy. So, in fact, Hegel is a huge lover of the three Socratics. So, these principles, that's why it's important that we start with the beginnings of philosophy and work through the history so that we can understand. Great point, because we anticipated where this is going. That is a dialectic. Two ideologies opposing each other. Now, we're going to see, really, Heraclitus really gets into this. Because it's, he presents a dialectic, and the dialectic simply
synthesizes and makes a solution. So great fun. So just a little bit of teaser, and then we'll get into that in a little bit. So let's try to identify Bailey's. Do you think that he would fit more into being an empiricist or a rationalist? Think about his arcade. So let me just provide a summary again of rationalism, an emphasis on explaining the universe and reality in terms of non-empirical things, and rational principles, non-empirical things, rational principles, and that your knowledge is not restricted nor is it justified through empirical, sensible things, but rather rational principles. <coughs> what do you guys think? What's his archive? Water. Would water fit into, is water an idea? Or is it something empirical? Would that change it for you? Well, if water is empirical and not an idea, and that's his fundamental ultimate explanation, his argument, would you think he's an empiricist or a rationalist? We talked about, do you think that he actually believes that literally? Well, remember we said he has to condescend and talk to people that only understand mythology. Is he involved in mythology or is he doing science and philosophy and taking poetic license? So that's why I said I encourage don't try to interpret these literally. But he's speaking to how would you explain, for example, that. Instead of, remember in mythology, the gods are determining everything, moving everything. Science is not providing supernatural explanations like gods moving all the items around and objects and people. It is now saying there is something inside the seed, the acorn, that's moving itself. Okay, if you're immersed in the myth, you're going to go, what? are you talking about? Well, you're going to have to condescend and say, okay, let me put it this way. It's full of gods. And they go, oh. See? You get it. So they have to use this sort of language. They're, remember, they're breaking out of the myth. But they can't completely separate. Otherwise, the conversation is going to be incommensurate with that society. They're not going to understand what they're saying. So that's why they're using this kind of language is they're breaking from the myth and they're developing science. So what he's saying is there is a natural principle in things that make them move and live and grow. They're not being moved by the gods. Now, how does somebody understand that? Again, in mythology, it's full of gods. Or, the magnet is alive. Really? Why would you think that? Because it moves. Only things that move are alive. This isn't alive. It has to be moved by something else. But doesn't it look, now it's going to take centuries or a millennium later for science to develop the concept of electromagnetism. That it actually is not alive. That there's some force in there that is like not a magnetic force that makes magnets move with iron. But you can see that they're trying to train those immersed in the myth to break from it by using this sort of language. So I'd say because his fundamental principle, because his RK is not God's, it's water. And water is an empirical element, but he's an empiricist. Now, 
uh, his pupil is student and that's Amanda of Miletus 575TC. And I put up the fragments there for you. Okay, what is an examiner's arcane? What is his fundamental principle that explains everything? The infinite, yes. He said that the principle and element of all things is the infinite. By the way, if you ever see these prefixes, I am, on, um, ah, uh, they're negative prefixes, they do not. Unambiguous means what? Yes. Oh, this I am as well. Immortal. Not mortal. Infinite. Not finite. Finite comes from the word. How to become smarter. 
this is whole concept of like smart cards and stuff like that. Just play as you can play like on that house. I was like, oh, you can get smarter than all the other. What was my name with you? Shouldn't have it. What's that? Not my wife, 
correct? That's a true statement. That's neat. It's not my car. It's not one of you students. Um, all of these are true statements, even though I may not know what that is. Isn't something going on very similar with the infinite? When you say, what explains physical and empirical things? Well, we can't have more of the same. Well, then what are you going to I don't know what it is, but it's not finite. It's That's probably what's going on in an examiner's reasoning. As that he realizes the failures of his teacher Thales of not putting the question mark down far enough. Therefore, what seems to be somewhat correct in his reasoning out that I don't know, but it's definitely not more of the same, it's the infinite. That's the fundamental explanation, archaic of everything. And you see this throughout the rest of his fragments. If the nature is everlasting, does not grow old, it's deathless and indestructible. Now, this is something that comes up in Immanuel Kant. This is a concept, an idea, the infinite. You can't taste it, touch it. Um, And what Kant would say is, I'm trying to remember the, I'll look at the exact quote, I don't want to butcher it. Of a 
purple flying unicorn. That's not like saying, I'm a married bachelor. My brother is a married bachelor. Well, that's a contradiction. That, that can't be. We know that's not real. There are no married bachelors. But what about being flying unicorns? Well, I don't know until I have some type of sensible content that I can attach that concept and idea to. I want to say the same with an examiner's RK is the infinite. How do I know that's not just a, a figment of your imagination? I have nothing sensible to plug into that idea of the infinite. Legitimate critique? Which might be the reason why this student, Anaxemenes, in 550 BC, pushes back. Sometimes, it's often actually happens, not just sometimes. When you break from your parents or your teacher, you learn all the values and ideas, but you want to establish your own autonomy and identity. So sometimes you may take certain things while rejecting the other and synthesize your ideas in a new way that's your own. Now I have individual ownership over this idea. It's mine. Something similar goes on with an examiner. Sorry, an examiner. What is his RK? Infinite air. This is going to come up in the quiz. Make sure, some people say air. That's not what he says. He says infinite air. It's the principle from which arise things that, come, that are coming to be and that are and that will be gods, things divine, and the rest. So he's even saying the whole, even the gods, are not RKs. It's infinite air that's going to explain the human gods. The human gods need to breathe infinite air. What would you say? Does Anaxemenes fit more into an empiricist or more of a rationalist? Almost moderate, yeah. I think you maybe go a little bit more in. Why? Because he has air, but it seems that he took from his teacher an examiner, a correct idea that, no, you cannot give more of the same in your explanation and expect that that's going to be a legitimate explanation. The infinite, but reminiscent or foreshadowing Immanuel Kant, ideas without content are, they, are vacuous. That's, so what does he do? What does he plug into the concept of the infinite? What element of the four elements is most likely unbounded? Air, doesn't it just seem to be one for the other? Isn't that neat? Like how you synthesize that and work through. There seems to be a progression in thought. Does it seem to be getting better, a further refinement? You identify certain problems with your predecessor and you try to correct that. Hopefully, you're getting closer to the truth. Questions? So you can't define the definition of death and the definition of death. Would it be bad if you got a formula to find a definition of I think what he'd take his teacher and say, no, you're right. The definite or physical things need to be explained as things that are not physical. And so his predecessor, his teacher, and examiner was definitely a rationalist. But He's probably lying more and he's pushing back more towards becoming an empiricist by saying, well, I don't think that might be any better than conceptually, yes, I see where you're going, but that doesn't seem to be real. So we need to plug in some type of sensible content into the correct idea of the infinite being an archive. But it would just be an unreal figment of your imagination, if you think, unless it corresponded to something physical and real. So I think that's what he does. In principle, he's agreeing with his teacher, but he's saying, guess what? You didn't put the question mark down far enough. Smart dance. You need to plug some type of sensible content in there. 
so that it's a real idea and not a purple unicorn. A lot of this is speculation. We're having to work again. We don't have the original writer, so we're really having to get into the spirit. We have to pretend like we're pre-Socratics for people in this age. And how are they thinking about this? Might this not be? And through dialoguing and talking this out, we get it's exegesis. Really, it's it's giving a way to understand what the text is saying and what the author is saying. We get perfect knowledge. No. We're, we're separated by 2,400 years and very different cultures and times. And so we have to do the best with what we have. And I think that's one way to do it is to work through. To kill a bug without the thing like a way. Kill a piece of bad thing not to. Good question. Other questions? I had a, a, a grad school class in philosophy of science, and grad school classes are really cool because you're small. This class was even smaller. It was in the professor's office, and there was only four of us. And every day we'd come in, he had the French press. We'd just sit around in his office, black coffee. in the grad school, you better ask them, do you provide French press coffee? <laughs> if not, I don't want any of your garbage. Huh. Yeah, I don't want the definition of coffee. Here's kind of a fancy, nice summary of each pre-Socratic philosopher their arcades. They use water and examine the earth, the infinite and examine the infinite air. So we've now covered the Milesians and now we're going to go into the Ionian philosophers, Heraclitus and Parmenides. Well, that was my 
sophomore um, philosophy class, so I was writing notes. I like that first line there. It is wise, listening not to me, but to reason. And the word reason there, logos. It is wise, listening not to me, but to the logos, to agree that all things are one. And there is this distinction within ancient Greek philosophy. You'll see this with Plato as well. What 
is Heraclitus' RK. And you can associate that RK with one of the four elements. So you can name what his RK is and then tell me, out of all the four elements, what's most like that RK? Do you want me to go back on the slide? Got it. Change. Now, what of the four elements is absolute? What of the four elements is most First is seawater and is measured in the same proportion as before the earth. But the second thing, oh, no, it was the previous one. I wanted. All things are exchanged for fire, and fire for all things, just as goods for gold and gold for goods. Um, oh, here's the state. So we're going to have to unpack this. Remember, this is like cryptic, strange fortune cookies that we're going to have to try to understand. The sun is new every day. Now, I encourage you not to take the fragments literally. So if we were to take that fragment literally, that every day that you wake up and see the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, is that what is what he's saying the sun is new every day is because there's a magic man down here in the cosmos, and he has a grab bag full of sun. He said, you know what, I'm going to trick this guy. They're going to think that that's the same sun, but I'm throwing a new sun up there. <laughs> you line them up. <laughs> Is that what he means? The sun's new every day? From our perspective, the value of the new sun is the sun is new every day. So when the sun comes up, that's what the sun is. Okay, but what's being modified there? Is it the sun is new or the day is new? The sun is new. So he's trying to get to kind of, I think, more of an abstract idea. Uh, maybe number 15 will help. Changing it rest. So rest is stability. Change the lack thereof. You've heard this phrase. The only thing that's stable, the only thing that doesn't change is the fact that that is not really what he's saying. So let's apply that to you. The sun is new every day. Yes, sir. It's not exactly the same sun that we saw yesterday. It's slightly different sun that change. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about... Everything, yeah, you're not even the same. The cells are changing. And not only that, everything that could be said and predicated of you is true. If I'm in the room at this time, and the bird flying by the window, all the different things, is that ever the same? No, the next day, so there's a tree here, that flock, Birds might not be there. You might be in a different position. So that leads us to number seven. It is not possible, okay, and we have to take this metaphorically, to step in the same river twice. Now, why is that just literally impossible? Can I step in the same river twice? Because water is not moving through the rivers. Right. So the rivers. Moving downstream. That space that you're stepping in, if you try to step in it again, where is it now? Down the river. So there's three things in this metaphor that we need to identify with. What in this analogy is the river in our, in our life? What is the stepping? What is the stepping? Or what is the foot? What is the stepping? Is the bit of time with my hand? Yes, the foot. It's interesting, I was just in a philosophy group on uh, Friday. 
And time's gonna is a very tricky issue. We'll actually have a wonderful lecture on time. But modern physicists tend to think of time as almost something like a like a room. It's like some type of substance in which events happen in. But for the ancients, time is not something out there. It's not extramental. Time is the measurement. of things moving. The numbering and measuring of movement. So movement and speed are different than time. So uh, for a lot of philosophers, they're going to think of time as quasi-psychological. Things can move, but time is kind of recording or measuring the movement of it. So for does time change itself? Well, it's not a thing, perhaps, that is out there that can change. But what is changing? And therefore, you notice it via the concept of time. What space? Uh, is space moving? Or changes? So it's changing. Objects. Objects, things. So, right, correct. So the river is change. Change. The world of the universe changes. So Heraclitus is saying everything in the physical universe is constantly changing. You can, maybe at different rates, some things, clouds change a lot faster than rocks. The rocks erode and they change too. Everything's changing. If I say one plus one is two, am I saying one plus one plus two? By the way, that's a true statement, correct? And I'm going to show you that truth implies permanence, implies rest. Because if we woke up tomorrow and that wasn't true, the next day is a different number. We're not saying, oh, it's getting close. One plus one, it's becoming two. It's not there. One day it'll grow up to two. It's not now. We're saying it is. Statements of knowledge, true justified beliefs, are like taking a photograph of the world. The world's moving, and you're trying to capture it in a still frame. Got it. There, I've got it right there. Well, our propositions and our thoughts are very much like that. The world's moving, and we're trying to take a photo by saying, there is a table. Now, if you, you said, oh yeah, and took it out, pulled the rug out. Could my state, there is a table, oh, it's gone. Could my statement be true at that one point? It's that the reality of the situation changed. Try this one, even better. Are you in the room right now? Right now? Where's that now hitting? Right now. Did that now just stay there forever? It's gone. It's down the river. So that can't be a true statement. Everything's changing and in flux. Holy flux. That's disturbing to me because, and it should be for you as well, because if knowledge implies permanence, I'm not saying it was, it will be, I mean, I'm saying it is, one plus one is two, then can I have any knowledge of anything if everything's constantly changing? We're in the room now, no we're not, that now is gone. There's a tape, no, it's gone. That's a tree, okay, not in a hundred years, let me burn it up, it's gone. Can we know anything? This is going to set up for Plato. This is why I'm breaking this up. So keep that in mind. Let's get into, keep it on the back burner so that we can get into Plato. So what, in the analogy, 
the foot that you're going to use to step in the river, or your thoughts, your statements. And the river is reality, the river is constantly changing. So if you keep trying to trap people, as Heraclitus said, the master, isn't it true that you can't even step in the river once? It's like, bravo! You get it. Yeah, that's correct. If you really want to take it to its logical conclusion, you can't even step in at once. It's Everything's in flux. Okay. He's called Heraclitus the Absurd. He gets this motto, this uh, nickname. Because how many people have heard of argument an argument called a reduction of ad absurdum. In mathematics, we call them arguments by the theory of contradiction. Speaking of, how do I know that that all triangles angles add up to 180 degrees? Is it because I measure it? I guarantee you, if you measure those angles, it's not going to equal 180 degrees. But that's just because maybe. I'm not that great at drawing. And if I can get more precise. Well, you'll never get precise enough. It'll always be a little bit off. That's because that's simply an illustration of a triangle. That's not a real triangle. A triangle is an abstract idea. So how do I know that? Well, I could do is Euclid, the father of geometry, did a reductio ad absurdum. A reductio ad absurdum assumes the opposite of what you want to prove. Let's assume that A, B, it's angles A, B, and C are greater than 180 degrees. What I want to prove is that they're equal. So a reductio ad absurdum will assume the opposite. Okay, it's greater. If in your reasoning you then therefore get to a contradiction. Remember, we defined, that was why it was very important, we defined the three fundamental law of thought. The third fundamental law of thought was the law of non what? Something, let's call it an X, cannot both be A and not A at the same time in the same manner of speaking. So if I get to in my proposition X, equals A and X does not equal A. That is a contradiction. And by definition, contradictions are false. Contradictions are absurd, so absurdities. So what we can do in reasoning is to take somebody's argument or take the supposition and reduce it to a contradiction or absurdity. Know that and then Euclid goes, well, maybe it's less. He does it again. He reduces it to sir. Process of elimination. It's either greater or it's less or it's equal. It's not greater. It's not less. Therefore, the angles of all triangles equal. The sum of angles equal what? It's not So, now you know what an absurdity is. It's a contradiction. And let's find out why people were calling Heraclitus Heraclitus the absurd. Can you find an absurd statement in here somewhere? Changing at rest. Fire lives the death of air, air lives the death of fire. I don't know if that is. Let's find a better, like one that's more clear. I think you're onto something, but. Yes, this is what Aristotle calls contraries. 
there's certain things that are mutually uh, contrary. I'm sorry. What is left? Yeah, so right. What's right? Yeah. It should depend upon to. Can up, which means not down, be the same thing as down? In other words, can not down be this equal to down? Right? What is that called? Remember, contradiction involves the addendum at the same time and in the same way. My dog is alive is a true statement, but can be alive. It was alive. That statement was true 15 years ago. It's not true now. But that's not a contradiction to say my dog is alive and it's dead. Because I haven't added the clause the condition of time. But wouldn't I be contradicting myself if I said my dog is both dead and alive at the same time? Yeah. And you'd have to say, well, do you mean by alive and dead in the same sense? No. I'm equivocating. Then you're not contradicting yourself then. But if I say in both senses, I mean by dead, not alive, in the same sense that I'm alive, so my dog is both dead, not alive at the same time, in the same manner of speaking, they do, they contradicting themselves. So oftentimes it seems like somebody's contradicting themselves. And what we have to do is use distinctions and flush that out. And distinctions is the road to knowledge. Let me put it this way. You're all the same. Well, maybe. In what way? Oh, let's harken back to all men are created equal. And by men, we mean two men. Well, I'm looking around the room and it doesn't look like we're equal. We all have skin color, hair color, talents. So, how do you qualify that statement? We're all equal in what? We're all human beings. You made a distinction to avoid a contradiction, and by doing so, you did philosophy and acquired knowledge. Isn't that nice? So, what's spectacular about Heraclitus, even though he's being called the absurd and seems like he's making contradictions, what he's doing is he's setting up a framework to allow for Aristotle to come up and create the science of logic. The tools of reasoning and thought that allows you to discriminate, to make distinctions, and acquire knowledge. So he is a foundational figure within the history of thought, because it's through these statements that people go, wait a minute, down and up can't be the same? Well, really? If I tell you, let's beat me up right now. And you're walking up. So well, where do I take? Take the road up. And I'll meet you on that road. So I got there early, and I'm coming back down. And you're coming up. The road up. The different road. The road I'm taking. The road up and the road down are one and the same. How do I avoid making a contradiction? By making a distinction. We're traveling on the same road, but in different directions. A law and a distinction. Knowledge. See why this is important? Day and night are the same. Day is not night, and night is not day.
Call all the night. Somebody taints. And then somebody puts on you. No, it's one and the same thing. But seen from two different perspectives. In terms of. So it's forcing us into avoid contradictions by making distinctions, thereby applying knowledge. There's some really good ones here. Um, this concept of love and war will come up. War obviously does what to people? It kills. Yeah, it's, it destroys. I'm going to war against the machine and you're going to break down the. What does love do? Fine. So these are again kind of metaphorical principles, parking back to mythology use is, is there really literally love and war in, in nature? No, there's some type of principles and we're just calling them by poetic names. Negative and positive in the electromagnetic field. What do they do? So do you see, going back to your question, you have this dialectic. He thinks that all of nature is one. It's going to be the same as Parmenides. Everything's good. But that one road, the one is the real. But it's seen from different perspectives. That is the dialectic. A and not A. The synthesis. Reality. This comes up in Hegel. Problem. Right and left. Solution. Synthesis. And then another one. Dialectic. Back and forth. And you even do this in your reasoning as well. You have a sort of dialectic thesis antithesis. I think it's time to go. I object. I think it's not. I think there's two minutes left. So. <laughs> but I think professors can let out early. Another response. Well, I think you're wrong. that back and forth, and the idea is that push back and forth, each time that you answer the other, hopefully you're nearing further into the solution, the truth, the reality of the, who was Hegel's favorite pre-Socratic? Probably. All right, good one guys? Good one. Up on Parmenides and then from Parmenides up. Read Zeno. Zeno is in the other pre Socratics, uh, or you can just look up some of those paradoxes about motion.